Groovy. Welcome, everyone. Um, today I'm here to talk to you about building a culture of learning and sharing um, and my experience in doing that at ZipRecruiter. Uh, but before I really get into that, who am I? Uh, my name is Graham Termarsh. I live up on Vancouver Island, British Columbia. Although it kind of shares the same name as Vancouver, it's not necessarily close to Vancouver. I'm a four to five hour drive away, uh, including a 90 minute ferry ride. So getting to Vancouver and back in a single day, no, not gonna work. Um, you can find me as GTermars on CPAN. And I've been a Pro developer since the mid 90s. Uh, I think it was about 96, 97. And I had the opportunity to work with Active State, uh, which then got bought out by Sophos uh, and spent about almost a decade working with them on and off. But I've been a career consultant and career contractor which has meant that much of my career history has been spent working on dark pan projects. Not just code that we're not allowed to release, but unfortunately also includes lots of fabulous things like companies. I'm not even allowed to say that I worked for them, never mind what project we worked on. So I'm really happy to be able to say that I'm here today with ZipRecruiter and I can finally talk about the stuff that we're doing at work. But uh, a little bit of a disclaimer, what I'm gonna talk about here, these opinions are mine. They're not necessarily the opinions of the company. For our purposes at ZipRecruiter, we've started up what we call a Lunch and Learn. It's a webinar series, and originally we started it, it was really casual, bi-weekly, you'd bring your own lunch, and it, when we started we had less than a dozen people. It was really casual. We now regularly reach between 30 and 60 members of our development team. Uh, composed half on-site, sitting in a conference room, half remote, uh, being connected. When we reach 50 members of our team, that's approximately one-third to one-half of the size of our entire development team, which is pretty astonishing. Um, we originally started bi-weekly. This year, however, we're going to change it. We're going weekly uh, because it's been so successful and obviously that effectively doubles the number of talks we can do and doubles the number of presenters that we need to have. But first, before I really get into sort of the nitty gritty, a bit of a story. How did it all begin? Um, it actually started here at Yapsi in 2015 in Salt Lake. So it's actually really fitting that I do this talk here. But it didn't really start here. I think it started over at the Bayou we were there, I think Matt took a whole bunch of people over. We had this huge table, there was good food, good company, good drinks, probably a little too many drinks, but that's half the fun. And it was Grigor's fault. And if you've worked with Grigor, you would understand it's always his fault. Um, we stayed really late, in fact, past close. Um, he and I were shooting pool and got talking about work and talking about what I've done in the past. He's like, Graham, you know so much of this stuff. You, know, you really need to teach me how to do some of these things. I don't know this stuff. And then I had my light bulb moment. I was like, wow, you know, he's young, he's in his early 20s, and no one had taught Grigor or all of these other devs that were starting to work with us how to do a bunch of things. And without that kind of training, developers, they're going to simply repeat the mistakes of the past. Us that have been in the industry for 30, 40 years, we see that there's approximately a 10-year cycle. You know, the mistakes come back again, and they hit us time and time again. And we're like, wow, didn't we talk about this before? I thought we figured out how to deal with these types of issues of testing and memory management and code control. Um, but they keep coming back. And that's when I stopped and was like, you know, if us older senior developers who've got experience and who've been in the industry, if we're not actively mentoring and teaching the junior devs who come on, we are not going to break that pattern. And it took a while though. I worked one-on-one -on -one with devs over the course of the next year, including Grigor. Um, <coughs> we'd do pair programming. I'd have guys just sit and watch over my shoulder. We'd you know, make time. I would have open office hours. People could just ping me at any time. I'm happy to sit down with you for an hour and answer your questions about anything I can help with. And while it felt like progress and I was helping get some of the word out, it didn't really feel like substantial progress. It took a lot of effort. And so one day, I made a commitment. Uh, twice a year at ZipRecruiter, we hold some internal tech talks, usually mid and end of year. And I was standing up doing a presentation on testing, why we do it, what are the values, how everyone else can get involved. 
And at the end of that talk, I announced that starting that January, I would be doing a bi-weekly one-hour webinar. And I was like, okay, now that I've told the whole team I'm going to do this, I'm kind of committed. Because if I don't, I'm going to look like a fool. And so a few weeks later, we began. And initially, it was just me speaking. We did it during lunch hour, so we're not taking away from people's time, which made it an easier sell at the company. Uh, we do it every other week, which provided me some time to get material together. And I would present topics that I knew and that I was passionate about. And shortly thereafter, we started to get some feedback. And some of it was really good. You know, we love the passion and the excitement that you have when you get up and speak. The topics are useful. They're applicable to what I'm doing. But then one of the founders showed up, and I got some interesting feedback. He's like, why didn't you order lunch for everybody? I like, uh, I didn't know I had a budget. And so we started ordering lunch. And, but as I said, it's a lot of work. Um, I'm doing a one-hour presentation every two weeks. I'm the only person doing these presentations. I have to write the slide decks. And pretty soon, I'm going to start running out of topics. So I put out a call for speakers. I asked for help. And thankfully, some of my peers responded. Some people reached out to me with a topic in hand of, hey, I would like to come and present whatever. And others, I had to chase down as subject experts. I'd instead get a request for a talk. But I still ended up doing a majority of these presentations. And so things continued on. Wow, that's out of order. After the first year, we'd done 23 webinars. Six of them had guest speakers, which meant that I was doing way too much talking. So I put out another call for help. At our semi-annual Tech Talks um, that December, I put out another call for speakers, but this time I had a track record. I had a story to tell. I had an audience. I had brand awareness. And thus far, in 2018, we now have 11 webinars. Nine of them had guest speakers which is way so much easier for me. But it meant that my role changed. I'm no longer presenting. I simply facilitate. I help make the speaker's life easier. I evangelize. So I'm out telling the story. I'm out encouraging all the rest of our people to come and attend. Even if the topic is not about the language you are programming in, you know, come support you know, the person who's doing the talk. And that's why I'm here today. Because through this, we learned a whole bunch of lessons. We learned that keeping your schedule consistent was really important. We used the same conference room in the same time slot on the same day of week every two weeks. Everyone gets to understand the rhythm. We know that it's every second Thursday. And as we get closer, we don't, if they've missed the announcement that got sent out via email, they're going to like, oh, what did we have for lunch last week? Oh, last week we went out, we did this stuff, we went out with all our the guys at work. Oh, that must mean that this week is a lunch and learn. So everyone gets into the rhythm and gets into the cycle. We learned, uh -huh. ordering food was important. Um, free food draws far more people than a cool topic. Who would have thought? Uh, yeah, who would have thought? I'm a tech guy, so I'm thinking like, oh, we've got these really cool topics. People will come and they're interested about finding out about the topic. No. People come for the food because you get, you know, with an interesting topic, you get the people who want to know about that topic. When you have free food, you get everybody else. You get people who have no idea what the topic's about. I get free lunch, pfft, I am in. I completely agree. Being remote myself, I would love to have free food for the remotes. Um, I also learned that I needed to enlist help. If someone offers help, say yes. And when you need help, ask. I facilitate, but thankfully all I'm really doing is coordinating. I now have a team of people that work with me to help make sure that we have the room, we have food. Um, the announcement has been sent out. We have you know, a handful of people that come and help do the technology and get it up on the big screen like we have here today. And really important, we learn to spread thanks. You know, sprinkle that stuff everywhere. All of our talks end saying thank you to everyone who helped. No matter how small their part piece of participation, everyone who helps ends up in a final slide with thanks. 
because that's part of you know, how we're going to support our speakers and support everyone who's coming. Um, my role changed to be one of facilitation, and so I'm trying to make the speaker's life easier. If the speaker has to show up and arrange the room and arrange the food, like, no, nobody wants to come do the talk if you're supposed to do all that work. My job is to make sure that the speaker just needs to show up with his slide deck. Someone will take care of the recording, someone will take care of the food, someone will take care of the room, someone will help them get it set up on the big screen. Lowers the barrier for, of entry for your speakers. Thus, you get more people that want to come speak. We learned it was also important to connect our remote workers. Obviously, I'm remote myself, so whatever we chose wasn't going to work unless I could be connected. Um, that also helped make it easier for me because I don't like standing in front of crowds. Um, but connecting your remote workers becomes really important. Uh, we use Slack and Zoom ourselves, but whether you use Google Hangouts or any other type of technology it becomes really important. Um, if you have people that are super busy, they can't attend the talk directly, they could listen in and tune in from their desk. Obviously, you can get all your remotes connected. Um, also ties to record and archive every presentation, as we are here today. The video and the slide deck. And when I ask my presenters to come, I ask them to provide their slide deck in whichever format they're using, whether it's uh, Google Doc, PDF, HTML, a bunch of text files that they're just going to page through. Send me a copy of it as it is when you present it. Not the copy that you're going to keep online, which you will edit later, but the copy that you presented, so that as someone's watching the video, they can refer to and see the slides exactly as they were in the video and follow along. It maintains history. And obviously, new hires and new people in your organization get to have that benefit. They can look back through all of the things that have been talked about before. And you get that corporate history you know, and cultural history. The added benefit when you speak is that you also get to go back and refer to your previous talks. You know, as we worked through our first year and we got close to the end, I was thrilled when people could ask me questions about, well, how do we do this? And I'd like to test it like this. And, I was like, oh, actually, we covered that in talk number three back in March, and you'll find a link, and we'd paste it into the Slack channel of here's where we had it in the wiki. If you refer to that, there's a whole section on exactly answering that question, which just becomes added value. Venturing off theme? Don't. Our talk series for Lunch and Learns is predominantly a technical talk series, so we need to keep them technical. Um, as with um, being consistent in what time and where your location is, having consistency in your theme makes it easier to keep your audience coming back. And we also found, I also found, makes it a far easier sell upwards uh, through the company. In fact, the only time I encountered any resistance whatsoever was the only time that we ventured off theme and did a non-technical talk. We did get it approved, but it was the only time I actually had to have someone look at it, read through the slide deck, and check off that, yeah, yeah, we can do that. Was that the beer one? Yes. That was, that was a good talk. It was a really good talk, I agree. How was the talk technical? Yeah. Involved. Yeah, there weren't any computers involved. It was a talk about uh, beer, cheese, uh, fermentation which, although many of us would enjoy, um, was not considered a strictly technical talk. Um, doing enough of these presentations, you know, what I found important, not just for myself, but I also remind everyone who comes to speak in our series, is to avoid presenting topics you don't know about. If you really don't know a lot about it, why are you talking? But if you want to come do that kind of talk, simply reframe it. It's not, I'm here to tell you about this subject, because now you've framed the discussion as you are the subject expert. Instead, if you frame it as, I wanted to learn more about this subject, so I went and did some research, and here's what I learned. You've now completely reframed um, the expectation that your audience has. And, of course, expect the unexpected. There will always be technical issues. There will always be glitches. The food will arrive late. The previous meeting will run over and you won't get the room on time. Someone will do a live demo, and we all know how well those go. So plan time for things to go sideways. Uh, we do a one-hour webinar. 
I tell my speakers to plan for between 40 and 45 minutes. I expect that we're going to start five minutes late because that gives us opportunity for the previous meeting to end, for everyone to get settled, for food to arrive, for everyone to get food so they're not standing in line and crinkling bags of paper plates and all sorts of things. Um, and then we can begin. We have our talk. And then at the end, we actually have some extra minutes for Q&A. We have time to clean up the room because that's going to be important. Don't run over time. Respect people's time. Someone else is going to have that conference room booked after you, and you very much appreciated it when they closed their meeting on time, and you could begin. So respect their time. End on time. And if it looks like you're going to run late, that's okay. Just wrap it up and reschedule. You know, stay tuned for part two. You can come back and have that talk again, and you can finish it up. And if you get done early, fabulous. You can celebrate. Because who here does not like getting 15 minutes back in their schedule that they hadn't planned for? Everyone loves getting free time back. And it's OK to be nervous. Um, we're now 20 webinars in, or I'm 20 webinars in. I still get nervous every time, like right now. Uh, which is part of why I still do them at home. I'm just, I monologue to a black screen. I have no idea who's in the room. Whether we've got two people or 22 people, um, I simply get a count of how many people we have connected to the call. And for me, that made a huge difference. So when I want to wrap up, um, I have thanks I want to give. I want to give thanks to Grigor for poking me and suggesting that I do these lunch and learns in the first place. Everyone at ZipRecruiter who has attended, Andrew Grandgard, who actually suggested that I do this talk, obviously TPC, for accepting the talk. And I'd like to thank all of you here for joining me today. Questions? I run a, a, a video lunch and learn at my work uh, every two weeks on off sprint weeks. Okay. Um, and I, I always sort of alternate between technical and non-technical to bring in more people, but it's, it's fizzling a little bit. Okay. And I'm wondering if you think that that might be because of, of sort of that split focus. Uh, we're actually considering doing something similar. The question is, um, you know, finding that if we split between technical and non-technical <laughs> talks, you know, do we continue to get the type of attendance? Um, that's actually how we're looking to increase from bi-weekly to weekly this year, is we're going to stay on a two-week schedule, but we will for each theme. So we go weekly, so we'll do a technical talk, a non-technical or a business, technical business. Um, I think we are lucky enough, we have enough speakers, we can kind of have that done. Um, but we've also considered filling in some of the empty space in the event we don't have a speaker with pre-recorded sessions, um, such as past uh, Yapsi recordings, Amazon, Google. Okay, I've got, has uh, Lunch and Learns frequently, often two or even three times in one week. Wow. But, but, the, part, but the problem that I have working remote is that there's almost never any type of facility for me to view, let alone present. So two questions. Number one, what's the best uh, uh, package you found for remotes to use for both viewing and presenting? And two, what stops me from giving talks other than just quick off-the-cuff 10, 15-minute presentations uh, mm -hmm. uh, elsewhere is, how do you learn to make a slide pack? Oh. Okay, we'll address your first uh, question regarding what software have we found is useful. Um, I found Slack is useful for doing a webinar, which is you know, predominantly one way. Um, so I can present from my location to you know, an audience of almost any size. Uh, Google Hangouts also works, but obviously there are limits to how many people you can get connected. If you have a conference room where you can put it up on the big screen, that counts as one which is helpful, but depending on the size of how many remotes you have that you'd like to connect, uh, may or may not be a problem. Now, as for your second question about uh, creating a good, you know, how do you develop a slide deck, I'm using Google Docs. I'm sorry, what? Google Docs. 
Um, there's some great templates in there. One of the nice things is you can create your slides and then you can come back and just change the theme, which is kind of nice. Um, I would hope that your company probably has a theme that they're already using. Obviously, I've stolen ours. Um, if not, you know, Google Docs comes with about a dozen built in and you can just pick one. And the benefit then is also that um, you can view it anywhere, it's already online, and I found that much easier than using any sort of desktop presentation software. Okay, yeah, because typically if I talk about something, it's just, I talk, no slides or anything, and mm -hmm. I hope you've got a good imagination. Oh, yes, and you know, creating a good slide deck can simply be a keyword on each slide. You know, it's going to show the audience Hey, this is the topic, and you can then discuss that and elaborate it as you go. Uh, question for um, kind of follow up to Vic Brazil's thing. Uh, have you considered uh, framing stuff in such a way that at least some, at least once a month, you are able to publish those uh, video recordings fully to basically say, hey, there are puffins there too? Yes, we have had that discussion. Um, questions about have we had discussions about opening up um, our internal history of our recordings and history of our slides. And that has been discussed not only in the sense of can we open up the ones that we have already done, but also looking forward to see can we use our regular scheduled lunch and learn, not just as an internal event, but can we actually connect that via Meetup and the local Perlmongers group and get a larger audience and get more people to attend? I think it's a fabulous idea. Okay, but yes, we discussed it. Yes, yes we discussed it, and we will be doing that this okay. year. Yes. Okay, awesome. <clears throat> One last question. Yeah. Yes, we do. We use Zoom. Marvelous. Thank you. <laughs>